Give me money, give me money, give me money, give me money, give me money. Okay, so we have a lot of stuff to go through today. So in case you're worried that I'm about to rain on your parade or make you see something problematic you missed and ruin everything, the TLDR of today's video is... <laughs> <laughs> I've been hesitant to lay down a judgment on the Owl House in regards to LGBTA rep for the longest time, largely because there were plenty of opportunities for the show to prove to be piss will in this regard. The Lumity Crush was about the only thing the show had going for it, and even then, that was very thin on the ground. If Terrace wanted to, she could have dragged it out until the final episode, which would have made it completely worthless. That's a reasonable fear to have, because too many shows have gotten by on giving people crumbs and expecting to be praised for it. And now I'm here to eat a lovely helping of my own words, because we are being fed. The second and penultimate season of The Owl House isn't even half over, and we've already gotten two very wonderful additions. The first I'm going to highlight is Rain Whispers, because they're a subject that's been a bugbear for me for quite some time. Rain is a non-binary character introduced in Season 2, and later revealed to be Ida's ex-date mate. What I love about Rain is that they are respected by the story. A recurring, and indeed a very troublesome trend in modern cartoons is to treat non-binary characters as somehow alien or otherworldly, either figuratively or literally in certain cases. Well, I say trend, but there were really only two real examples, because non binary characters aren't as common as they should be. Steven Universe, for example, created a race of all femme-presenting bisexual aliens and called that non-binary rep for the longest time. And if that sounds suspiciously similar to the Asari from Mass Effect, you're not wrong to think that. It wasn't until the final season that they introduced a human non-binary character at all, which was actually pretty well done. She-Ra and the Princesses of Power introduced Double Trouble, a creepy and sneering trickster member of the Whore. <laughs> Three years and I'm still going with it. That could shapeshift at will, which is actually quite a worryingly ubiquitous trope. Neither of these shows really had positive representation, and positive representation is the only representation that matters. If I need to sit you down and tell you why aliens and villains don't count as representation, then you need to take off that red baseball cap. Rain Whispers isn't a human character, but the witches on the Boiling Isles are so close to humans that I put them on the same exception as elves or halfling, and Raid is treated with a great deal of respect by the show. They're not a villain, a side character, or even a one-off joke. They're a skilled witch that opposes Emperor Bellos' tyranny and has a complicated history with Ida. In their debut episode, it's all but outright stated that the two have feelings for each other, and in the following episode, they're shown to be exes, and Ida's still pretty torn up about it, blaming the Albies for ruining her life. From the moment they're introduced, Rain is sympathetic, engaging, treated with dignity by the story and in a decidedly heroic role. The only downside is that they're put in stasis at the end of the episode, and it's uncertain if we'll see them again before the finale, which would be a shame because I adore Rain. But the episode immediately afterward featured them in a very key moment for Ida, and given how the show doesn't really leave plot threads hanging for very long, it's likely we will see Rain again very soon. And even better, it turns out that Ida and Rain were childhood friends, making them a childhood friend romance trope, which is the best trope. I'm sorry, Mrs. Noceta, but they're just too cute. I hope they reconcile. They'd better reconcile. Also, Rain looks a little bit like one of my aunts, and I think that's just neat. I adore Rain, one of my new favorite characters. I love them so much. But I sadly have nothing else left to say about them. They are still a two-episode character that I am hoping will be more present in the future after Ida and Luz rescue them. Until then, all I have is wishful thinking, and it's important not to let wishful thinking get the better of you. On the opposite end of that spectrum, however... Amity Blight, do you want to go out with me? Yes! <laughs> Okay, so I had up until this point been ignoring the Owl House's ongoing Amity gay panic story arc on the simple basis that when it comes to LGBTA rep, I have a very simple mantra. Shit or get off the pot. Modern cartoon fandoms like to blame executive meddling when gay rep proves to be intangible fluff or absurdly convoluted and toxic, but executives operate on the basis of cut or don't cut. And too many times has the creative vision turned out to be terrible that I eventually crafted a set of bare minimum rules for LGBTA rep, with the assertion that any show that cannot meet all of them isn't worth talking about. When the Owl House started ramping up Amity's gay panic over Luz, I expected it to drag out until the end of the series, where there would be a dramatic declaration and no time to enjoy it. I kept my expectations low and refused to get invested in it or even cover. It. And I felt the same way about Amity's character arc as her development was predicated almost entirely around her crush on Luz, and therefore refused to cover it until they did something of value, and I'll fully admit I treated Amity as if those first few episodes were all we had. That was then, this is now. It's safe to say the Owl House can join the likes of the Loud House and keep on the Age of Wonder Beast and having very sincere, heartfelt LGBTA rep that actually 
actually does push the boundaries of what people are used to. It's wonderful there wasn't some dramatic confession of feelings involved in Luz and Amity getting together. Just Luz wanting to ask her out and the people around her encouraging her to do it. It's so simple. Just ask her out already. She likes you. Look at her. She's thinking about holding hands with you. <laughs> this is so pure. It's just so delightful. The only drama really involved in all of this is personal. For Amity, this is her first crush and she's having a hard time processing those feelings and Luce's presence on the Boiling Isles has completely upset a status quo that, while not happy for her, she had at least grown to tolerate. During the few months Luce is on the Isles, she destroys her faith in the Emperor's Coven, mends the rift between her and Willow, and even ends up being the catalyst to push back against her mother's abuse. It's all a huge paradigm shift where someone who has been terminally unhappy has shown that perhaps things could be just a little better. And speaking as somebody who's been in that position myself, the knowledge that things could be better makes it harder to be complacent when they aren't. For Luz, it's clear that this isn't her first crush. Luz has been a romantic for quite some time and has come to terms with not only her own bisexuality, but has a desire for romance in her life. And maybe meet a hot yet vulnerable upperclassman. But it's clear that her desires for romance never really grew into something tangible on Earth. She even admits that other people thought she was too cheesy and laments during the Tunnel of Love that she's going to get made fun of again. It's clear that she's tried to seek romance in her life before and failed, and that's what's really stopping her from just asking Amity out directly, this belief that she needs to meet some arbitrary standard before Amity will be interested in her. People sometimes clown on Luz for being oblivious to Amity's feelings despite them being brazenly obvious, but they're only obvious because the viewer has omniscience. We can see Amity's face get cartoonishly bright red, but not only is someone's blushing not actually that cartoonishly exaggerated, there's also the reality that it is extremely presumptuous and awkward to assume someone has feelings for you. So even if you can tell, you're likely not going to just ask, hey, do you like me? Because there's always the chance you're misreading, and then you've just embarrassed yourself, and all the people in the audience with anxiety issues are currently hating me for bringing this up. In truth, if it seems like someone is oblivious to another person's feelings, they're usually not as oblivious as they look. They just think it's rude to do anything else. It isn't until Ida just tells her to go for it that she finally decides enough with planning the perfect moment, she's just going to do it. It's cute and awkward and weird, and honestly it should be because they're kids. Kids are cute and awkward and weird, and there are probably kids watching who also want to ask out their crush and are fussing over it being perfect and probably need to be told. Does it really need to be? But the biggest leap of improvement comes from Amity. People say I didn't give Amity a fair chance during the first season, but I think I did. I never disliked Amity, she's not a bad character, she was just very tropey and very dull. And and at worst, I was only ever confused about how she became so inexplicably popular. But then Stitch said white favoritism, and I was like, Oh, okay. And admittedly, I should have figured that one out instantly, but oops, there I go being stupid again. Around season one, I would have called Amity the blandest character in the show. And being the blandest isn't a bad thing, especially when all of your character development centers around the best character in the show. Bland is inoffensive. Bland is tolerable. I guess people saw my complaints about Amity and was bracing for another extended hatred like I gave to Starlight Glimmer and Steven. But for all her failings, Amity has never come off as a creator's pet, more like a character that nobody really knew what to do with. And in season two, it seems the show staff heard my complaints and said, understood, begin the dorkification. Amity's character revolves around her feelings for Luz and her feelings of inadequacy that have been browbeaten into her by her parents, and the former directly affects the latter. As I mentioned earlier, it's Luz's rather unconditional affection for her that lets Amity believe that things can actually be better, and she doesn't have to tolerate this abuse anymore. And then she does. Rather than it being an extended character arc, it's the conflict of one episode because this is not a serialized show. But even after that, those feelings don't go away. After they get together, Amity just projects her pressure to be a top student into being the best girlfriend possible, which leads to her going far above and beyond what's necessary for Luz and even being prone to the Golden Guard's gaslighting when she can't read Luz's text believing that Luz is threatening her to come back with the Titan blood for the portal or they're over. But then it turns out that the message was Luz telling Amity that she's great because it's Luz. She literally texted her you're pretty when they were in the same room. And yeah, a rational person wouldn't jump to that conclusion, hence why King immediately sets the record straight, but Amity isn't thinking rationally. Her beliefs ingrained in her by her parents are not rational, and she doesn't know how to have real relationships with people that don't feel like transactions. And so she projects those things onto Luz even while Luz is showering her in love unconditionally. A lifetime of abuse and trauma cannot be fixed in a few weeks. Amity has to adapt to and learn how to have healthy relationships with people. Amity's speech to Hunter about growing up believing she had to justify existing. I felt that. 
I really did. It's the first time I could ever really relate to Amity in any way. And I look at the way Luz makes her feel so loved and so happy, and I just think about how Michaela makes me feel that way too. Hell, I've written characters who go through that kind of arc myself. The abuse Amity suffered from her parents was an excuse in season one for why she and Willow were no longer friends. A sad excuse, but that's all it was. It wasn't until season two that it was built on and very well. Indeed, it's a short arc covered in about four episodes, but it's a very good arc and it elevates Amity to the kind of character that actually deserves Deserves the hype, and it's all thanks to Luz, who has done this for too many people to count. Unfortunately for you, my life is pretty great because I'm friends with Luz the human. <laughs> At the very start of the show, Luz was shown to be disruptive, out of control, and incapable of pulling her head out of the clouds for five seconds. But after just a little bit of character development, she's shown to be unfailingly kind, giving, and loyal to a fault. She loves people unconditionally and asks for nothing in return but respect. And she has repeatedly made the lives of the people around her better just by being in them. And those are qualities the human realm never got to see because they never gave her the chance to show them. She truly is a wonderful lady, and they deserve each other. If there's one hope I have for the Owl House's impact, it's that we all learn to calm the fuck down. It's no secret that I have low opinions of the shows that many people hold up as ideal examples of LGBTA rep, but my opinions of them would be lessened somewhat if people didn't act like every single inch forward was some kind of celebration. So many cartoons get branded as revolutionary when they really shouldn't be. I think the biggest problem is that we're extremely bad at giving a measured response, and this this rush to declare the tiniest crumbs as the best thing ever led to things like Korra, Voltron, and the Dragon Prince giving pandering lip service in order to score easy points and praise, only one of which was even able to do that. I said about She-Ra that if Spinnerella and Natasa had been the main focus and their relationship had been less in the background instead of the galo clusterfuck of Adora and Catra, it would have been exactly everything I asked for. Double trouble notwithstanding, seriously, why is it always shapeshifters? And the Owl House proved to be exactly that. But even I'm trying not to fall into the same trap of overhyping and overstating what it's done. The Owl House is good. Very good. But I would caution anyone calling it groundbreaking, because the ground was already broken by 16, and the foundation laid by the Loud House, and now it's time to build the fucking house with Kipo serving as the architect. If all you do is break ground, you just end up with a bunch of holes everywhere, a bunch of hacks looking way too pleased with themselves, and some very pissed off day laborers. And this particular all or nothing discourse only creates this cycle of backpedaling, where shows get hyped up for gay rep that isn't really there, and then have to go back and redefine it as walking so new shows could run. If we could just have a measured response, at the start, maybe this would be less of a cyclical problem. Maybe we could talk about what needs improvement without people freaking the fuck out like you've just murdered their dog. Because the Owl House can still improve. They said girlfriend, which is great. Now all Amity has to do is kiss her, you fool. I swear, if they save that for the finale, I'm gonna mail a frowny face to Dana Terrace's office. That'll show her. One thing I hope to see from all this is people actually recognizing just how good it is to see a couple being together for longer than a split second. While the revisionist history machine is already churning with people claiming that the last second side glances of She-Ra or the Legend of Korra were all they could do because something something executive meddling, it's worth remembering that I've been banging this drum for years, and people argued with me that the finale was the best place to have a couple get together. People sincerely believe this about storytelling and romance, and this isn't exclusive to LGBTA ships. I do not believe for a second that executive meddling was the reason She-Ra waited until the last second to pair their main characters up. I believe it was the same very sincere but very flawed belief about romantic storytelling that let Starko go on for five years without anything tangible. That almost let Kim Possible end with So the Drama. That made people stop watching The Nanny in its best season because the sexual tension was gone. It has happened with straight ships to an embarrassingly frequent degree as well. This is a trope that persists because people like it and they want it and 90% percent of the time it is all they ever get and it's very rare for people to turn against it. Ross and Rachel and Starko were the only times I can recall offhand where the producers were the only ones who liked it and the audience was getting fucking annoyed. I hope this is the start of a shift because cartoon fandom is very intersectional and so one show can influence the desires of the audience of the next one. I'm not even here today to shit on those other shows because they delivered exactly what people wanted. What I'm hoping for is that because of the Owl House, people will realize that there is a better version of romantic storytelling that they are missing out on and will be less inclined to accept the same old shit again. Because this is a drum I've been hammering for so long. You guys have been missing out on something that is actually very fun, and I hope you see what I've been trying to say for years.